before we start, let me uh, take, I need to take a moment, guys, to go through the GMI uh, part of the program. You know, GMI is sponsoring this uh, webinar session and I'm the vice president of sales of GMI. So I need to do a little pitch on that. And with us is Bob, you know, Bob is our guest and speaker for today. Uh, he has over 30, year, 30 years of experience in the EX world. He's a Comp EX instructor and also an instructor for ICEX Comp EC scheme. He's an inspector, member of US UL STP committee. You were telling me now that you just become a member of a new committee, right? Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a chairman of a technical subcommittee within ASTM for the Marine Engineering Group, and we're actually working on a, uh, a new standard uh, that hopefully we'll have published by the end of the year that will be uh, kind of around this same area. Uh, the big, big move afoot is lean, using a lot of clean fuels uh, with tankers and ships and with all the conversion uh, due to green uh, policies, there's a lot more requirements. And so now it's, uh, it's, it's becoming very big around the world. And a lot of people are kind of trying to, you know, the oil and gas understands a lot about EX, but the marine business doesn't necessarily know as much. And so we're trying to write a technical guide standard that will kind of clarify a lot of this stuff specifically for the marine industry. So uh, very interesting. Uh, Lots of interesting discussions. So, yeah, a lot of time consuming. So, well, <laughs> so well, at the, at the, making a point here, he is more than qualified to run this webinar. So, let me give you a couple of minutes. This is an introduction to GMI. Uh, you know, we are a safety company, meaning that we manufacture, design, engineer a complete range of intrinsically safe and SILF certified devices or so safety interfaces. Uh, which are used in automation packages such as DCS, ESD, fire and gas, BMS, and so on, in all industrial sector, primarily oil and gas, petrochemical, pharmaceutical, food and bed, and so on. We have over 40 years of experience, and we are very proud to manufacture our product here in Italy, where I'm sitting, and the percent of the production is here in our headquarters. On the other end, we are a global player with presence in all the continents through our uh, Next, Bob, for our uh, distributor and subsidiaries, we have about 10 GMI offices here around the world, and we have 75 plus distributors, there are about 200 people, and we manage many, many projects, as well as courses. You know, we have a division that does uh, webinars, seminars, courses. We manufacture, and for us, safety is, you know, of most important, and hence we try to manufacture at our, as best as possible using state-of-the-art technologies. We have 100% traceability of our product. We do full testing. Every single item that leaves our factory has been tested, fully tested for an automated uh, process, process. We offer five years warranty and uh, we try to do the best we can because we care about the people that live and work in the plants we supply our product to. And next, of course, we have independent agency to testify the quality of our product, over 100% commitment to the compliance of, you know, from TUV, financial safety management, ISO 9001, ISO 45000, and of course, EX, Anatex, UL, certification around the world. Uh, next, Bob, I just don't want to take too much time here. So, oh, oh. okay, these are, sorry, whoop, whoop. one more, one back, yeah. just, these are our customers, you know, we basically serve all the customers, and these are the product that we manufacture, we have, once the slide gets there, we will be able to, to show. we have IS barriers, safety relays, with and without line monitoring, we have isolators, also C3 certified isolators, as well as power supply, which are SEAL and ATEC certified. We have SEAL 3 power supply. Believe it or not, we do have a full certification on the power supply. Multiplexer, temperature, digital, heart multiplexer. We have SPD, source protectors, uh, loop indicators. Uh, we do custom termination board for all the vendors out there. And as I mentioned earlier, functional safety and 
cybersecurity and EX training. The customer can skip. And I think we're on to you next, Bob, which is our webinar on ICX competency, what we need and why we need it. Okay. Well, uh, let well me thank you, Paul. One more second, Bob, before we start, guys. Um, you can ask questions. We, we have prepared, uh, we have received several questions throughout the registration process. We have prepared answers for it at the end of the webinar. We try to be within our one hour. We provide those answers. But if you do have any question to be in contact with us, there should be a button at the bottom of your screen. It says question and answer. You just type it in there and then we will try to answer. Okay, Bob, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Paolo. Um, so yeah, competency has, has become a, a much, much bigger issue in the in the EX world. And uh, so of course, people are always questioning, where did this come from? Why, why is it all of this good stuff? But really, let's let's boil it down. What is competency? Is competency is is more or less defined, if you will. And and I apologize, I've kind of got two monitors. Zoom has moved me around a little bit, so I'm kind of having to look over here and talk to you. But anyway. It encompasses a combination of knowledge, skills, and behavior, right? So a person that comes right out of a university and, and goes into industry and everything else, they have the knowledge, but, uh, but they may not have had that practical experience, or they may not have had the opportunity to put those skills in work. Uh, the same thing holds true for, say, a, an airline pilot. You can go through all the training, you can do your simulators, you can do all this good stuff, but ultimately you kind of need to have that work experience and, and then have that ability to, to determine whether or not you're competent. So competency is more than just the knowledge. It's, it's an underpinning of knowledge, but then demonstrating that knowledge, demonstrating those skills and putting it into practical aspects. And so competency is more, again, than just, just having the knowledge, right? And again, this, this talks a little bit about that. It doesn't mean that you have necessarily a person that has a ton of experience is necessarily competent. On the other hand, a person could have a very limited amount of experience, but it'd be extremely competent. So just experience alone does not demonstrate that a person is competent at their position. You could be doing the same thing over and over again, and it's wrong, right? <laughs> so... Uh, you know, but nobody knows it, nobody understands it, or, or nobody is the wiser. So again, the, the whole idea under competency um, and how this applies in the EX world uh, is that you need, to be, uh, you need to be deemed competent and how we deem it, and then how you demonstrate it, and then it needs to be documented. And that's the whole idea behind the competency schemes. So where did really the first underpinnings of competency really come from? And, and this is true with almost anything that you will find. Usually it's some sort of big industrial disaster that all of a sudden the regulators get involved or standard writing committees get involved and they start looking at it and say, well, what could have we done better, right? And Piper Alpha <clears throat> was a massive platform that exploded in the North Sea back in 1988. And uh, it accounted for about 10% of the production from uh, in the North Sea. And after that, there was a report that was issued by Lord Cullen in the UK. And it took two years to, to come up with, and they came up with about 106 recommendations uh, that were suggested to industry as well as, as well as the regulators. And one of the things that was put in there was a, an issue with regards to competency. Now, the issue with Deepwater Horizon was not necessarily an electrical issue, uh, it, or not Deepwater Horizon, excuse me, Piper Alpha. Uh, it wasn't necessarily an electrical issue, but it was a lockout, tagout procedural issue that led to uh, a, an inordinate amount of release of natural gas into the atmosphere that found a source of ignition and ultimately brought it down. So from that, from some of the reports, the regulations and everything else, there was a move afoot for some of these standards to start putting in competency requirements in these standards. And within the EX world, um, and I know some of you may be involved more in the manufacturing, some of you may be more in the, in the concept of design, maybe some of you are uh, responsible for designing of equipment and all this other good stuff. Really, the, the key standards to follow that really get into competency are the 60079-14 and the 60079-17 standards. 
The 14 standard is a design and installation standard. The 17 is an inspection standard. And there is now uh, a joint ISO IEC standard 80079-34 that applies to manufacturers. Uh, that is now defining competency for the manufacturer themselves, the individuals that are working on building EX equipment. So we're seeing this competency stuff permeate throughout the, uh, the various international standards. So then it comes down to, well, do the regulators require it, right? And this is a little bit of a hit or miss, depending on where you're located in the world. In the UK, the HSC has been pretty adamant about requiring competency, <clears throat> excuse me, for people that are working in, in hazardous locations. Uh, the Coast Guard here in the United States is actually now starting to require this in certain areas. And this is kind of a big topic that uh, is we're going to hear more and more of. Uh, and then in Australia, you have NOPSEMA that is also regulating a lot of this. So in various parts of the world, you're starting to see it. But if it's not just the regulators, in many cases, it may be the end user themselves that are starting to require this of the subcontractors, their own people, um, the whole, everybody within that supply chain, they're starting to require this. Um, and this was one of the things that the Coast Guard had come out with here recently here in the standpoint that they, they have what they call marine safety alerts. And this came out specifically around EX equipment that they were doing inspections and they were finding that there was a lot of issues with regards to EX equipment. Uh, I was involved actually in an accident investigation where a barge had exploded and killed two people for the Coast Guard. And that was directly attributable to basically some unsafe practices that involved hazardous location electrical equipment. So now the, the Coast Guard is starting to put these regulations in, which is kind of throwing, again, the U.S. industry a little bit for uh, people are starting to ask about this and, and wanting more. So. All right. Uh, so, Bob, we have a full question here. So, Bob, you talked about standards, but... We have a question for you guys. What standard includes the defined specific level of competency? What standard include specification or level of competency? I guess that is the right question, right? Well, so yeah. uh, why uh, you guys answer this question? Um, you talked about competency, you know, where is one data? I, I was thinking, you know, in the 61508 and 511. You know, the SEAL standard, it's a mandatory requirement, shall be, you know, shall have competency. So I think any industry, anybody who's applying these standards today will have to be, you know, prove competency some way or another. Yeah, and, and Paulo, that's, that's, the, that's the rub, right? The standard says it, but it ultimately falls to the regulators to enforce yeah, of it, course. right? By law, it's a different story. But uh, if you try, if you say, you know, I, I comply to the standard, you know, the customer and end user and installation, a skilled manufacturer says, I want to comply. Well, prove competency because you're not complying. Right, right. Uh, okay, let's end our poll. And the there we go. Share result. We have very mixed uh, result here, Bob. <laughs> yeah. And actually, there, there really isn't a wrong answer uh, to this. Now, now, I say that there is some wrong answers, but it is defined specifically in the 17 and the 14 standards, um, but it is also defined as well in the uh, 61508 functional safety standards, and it's also defined in the manufacturing standard dash 34. The 10-1 standard is your area classification standard. What it says about competency, it says that basically people that are responsible for undertaking area classifications shall be competent. So competency is actually referred to in a lot of different IEC standards, as well as EN standards and, and other country specific standards. So, so basically a trick question, you know, okay. <laughs> question. Everyone yeah. who would be the right answer, almost. Yeah, pretty much be, be there. Okay. So now again, we again try to learn from our mistakes and we, we you know, the big industrial accidents that in the oil and gas industry that we're all aware of is what happened with Deepwater Horizon about 10 years ago in the Gulf of Mexico. So 
you know, millions of gallons of oil spilled. The economic impact actually now is, is uh, it's believed it's actually higher than $45 billion. But uh, obviously it was a huge, huge uh, disaster. And sometimes we forget about the fact that, you know, obviously it spilled a lot of oil, but there was 11 people that died. And uh, anyway, there was also a report that came out of this one and this was a joint report published by the u.s coast guard and it was done with the other regulator in the gulf of mexico the uh, organization which is part of the department of interior called bessi and they tried to determine actually what the source of ignition was and if you've seen the movie it's it's pretty interesting the the belief was that there was actually a pressurized building in which the door was left open and uh once you had a blowout, uh, the vapors actually went into the engine room and oversped the engine, the lights got brighter, and then it ultimately ignited. But it was never really ultimately determined exactly what, what the issue was. And actually, there was some electrical equipment that had been left on the drill floor in a zone one area that had been in very, very bad condition. So they kind of left an out, if you will, to say, well, it could have been this, it could have been that, but ultimately they never came up with a final conclusion actually as to actually what did cause that initial explosion. Um, but on the other hand, these are actually some pictures of some equipment that were on some rigs operating right around the same time uh, of EX equipment located in hazardous areas. The picture on the left-hand side is actually a picture of a motor located in a zone one area. The, the other picture in the middle is actually a signaling device located in a zone two area. And on the right hand side is an enclosure located in a zone one area. So this, these pictures were not unusual, if you will. <clears throat> um, and they're still unfortunately not unusual about what you will actually see in a lot of hazardous areas today. So again, it's proper selection, proper installation, and, and just as importantly, proper maintenance. Uh, we have to be aware that this equipment, when we're putting it into hazardous areas, they can also be extremely corrosive. Uh, we need to be aware that this equipment will ultimately fail, and we have to make sure that we're staying on top of it. So one of the big things about competency that comes up, it's always believed as, as engineers, we like to think, hey, we don't make the mistakes, right? It's, it's usually those guys in the field that are doing stupid things, right? And yes, there are issues with regards to operators, the technicians that, you know, they're not necessarily following safe work practices. But in reality, there was a great study that was done years ago by the HSC in the UK that started studying major industrial accidents. And they found that in many cases, 44% actually of some of these major industrial accidents, the root causes came from specifications, meaning that uh, it could have been a product that was specified wrong, or maybe they specified the wrong technology for a particular area or they didn't have the right technology. Uh, so a lot of these root causes actually do come from engineers and designers not doing their due diligence at the very upfront. And the, and, the, and the horrible thing about that, right, is if we don't do it right at that point, no amount of work downstream when we start installing it and we start maintaining it is in many cases gonna make it right, right? Because if we have a failure or we make a mistake very early on in these projects, it's, it's, it makes it that much more difficult to rectify. If something, a technician installs something incorrectly, that can be caught, that can be fixed. But if we have the wrong equipment out there or the wrong technology, uh, now we're talking a major undertaking to try to fix this problem. So many of these issues can be deadly, and there was a there was uh, there's been numerous studies that have been done on electrical equipment and mechanical equipment for use in hazardous areas, uh, talking about equipment that's installed or improperly installed or not properly used, and in many cases that range could be anywhere from 20 to 45 percent. Uh, every time when I've done inspections. Uh, I will find things. Now, some of them are, are pretty minor, but some of them can be real safety critical issues. 
Uh, but generally speaking, the people that are calling outside auditors or inspectors to come in and do this kind of work, you know, they're, they're trying to be very good about it. And, uh, but everybody makes mistakes and we find issues, but yeah, it can be a significant portion. What you see there, there's a gas panel that was located in a zone two area, and it specifically stated that it was suitable only for a non-hazardous area. So that is certainly a big issue, right? Yeah, well, so, we do have another question. This is an easy one, Bob, because <laughs> uh, you, we just been discussing, so I won't give too much time. What is the leading root cause of industrial access? And it's, uh, I find that I always found it very, 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 uh, amazing that, that you know that it's not just the leading cause it's 44 percent so it's, it's a big chunk of accident happened because of this and uh, and as you said you see you know wrong maintenance you see you know wrong wiring but uh you see a lot of wrong problem also somewhere else i see your answer yeah. coming in uh, yeah, they should all be in one line. They are not, meaning that you guys are not listening carefully, or maybe you are not clear enough for what we're talking. Let me uh, <laughs> uh, give it a few. Uh, everybody's clicking in, so let's give it a few more seconds. Okay. Uh, Paolo, let me answer uh, Alito's question. And hi, Estelito, thank you for, for joining us. Uh, and it's a very good question. He, uh, he stated, note that the IEC standards, excuse me, I can't speak. IEC standards are voluntary so that they are not considered legal in order to require competencies. And that's true. Again, the standards will, will put this information in there and the standard will say you shall or you must or you need to do this. It's up to the regulators, right? And, yep. that, and I cannot emphasize that enough. It's really up to the regulators uh, or the end user or some combination thereof who is basically enforcing this, right? What we so, were saying earlier, Bob, is that, of course, the, oops, I clicked the wrong button. Um, of course, they are, uh, yes, the result. Of course, you know, they are, uh, I click, uh, I closed the answer, sorry, uh, a voluntary standard. But what we're saying is if you, if you claim that you are following the standard, then you have to, you know, follow the standard. It is a yeah, I mean, choice. Sometimes it's a mandatory choice. There are countries, and they were talking to Tino. I don't remember which country, but there are two or three countries that made it, you know, the standards uh, a law. So you have to write the standards. But, you know, in many cases, you see people say, we are this and that, but then they're missing a lot of part of it. So, you know, it is like right. for us. If we claim we sell a C3 certified barriers, but we do not have a scheme of competency in place, or we do not have a financial safety management in place, which is required by standard, then how can we claim it? You know? Right. And if you go and, to and a third party like TUV for us to get a certificate, they will check that and say, okay, do you have that in place? Yes, yes, else you will not get a certificate. Well, and, and here's the other thing that I think a lot of people, you know, immediately when you say we demand competency of our individuals, okay, that's cost, right? There's money, time, cost associated with this. But but I also try to highlight to people, and I've had this, I, I, I can tell you unequivocally, unequivocally from my own experiences that People that have been through these competency programs ultimately will catch these mistakes before they become issues. And, and usually what happens is that, you know, when a, when a client inspector, and I've done this on the behalf of clients going in at the 11th hour to go investigate some say skid packages, and then we start finding things, well, guess what? That means I can't ship it out. I've got, you know, progress payments or I may have penalties. I have all this other stuff. I've got to pay overtime. I've got to rush products and do all this good stuff. If we can get into the habit of catching these issues before they become issues, then obviously it can it can save you a significant amount of money. So it's it's not just, you know, yes, it's costing you some additional money to make sure that your people are competent, but it actually does pay off. And that and that's why a lot of companies are more or less doing this. Yeah, All right. you know, let's, there's a comment let's... says that they should be required, but it is not all everywhere. So the answer was very mixed, whereas uh, we said that 44% was specification. So the leading cause, yeah. root cause, was specification. Okay, uh, this is the result. I think I've seen it, right? Uh, you stopped it, right, Rob? 
Yeah, I did. I did. Ah, okay, so, sorry. Go on. So let's, let's go on. Okay. So what do the standards say? And, and the standards are, are pretty brief. There's actually not a lot written into the Dash 14 or Dash 17 standards. Um, more or less what you see there, it's divided into three roles, uh, what the standard is actually written up. Uh, there's a responsible person that could be a project engineer, project manager. They're the operator technicians. So these are typically the electrical technicians, the operators, the people that are actually working on the equipment. And then finally, there's the designers and engineers. So those people are responsible for the selection and the design of the systems. So the competency requirements are also divided up into those three roles. And we would expect that individuals that are responsible for the installation should have additional knowledge, maybe in lockout, tagout, right? Uh, safe working practices. A designer should have maybe higher level of knowledge with regards to understanding the certificates, reading certs, the, what does the design standard say? A responsible person might have uh, more real responsibility for documentation and those types of roles and responsibilities. So it, 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 the standard is somewhat open-ended a little bit, and it kind of gives you kind of big overviews, but those are kind of how it's broken down. So what does the standard say as far as assessment? It shall be verified and assessed at regular intervals. Generally speaking, the competency certificates uh, issued by various organizations, including the IECEX, are good for five years. And five years is the basis based upon the fact that the standards generally change every five years. Now, in some cases, that's not the case, but they shall provide sufficient evidence that they have the skill, can act competently, and have the relevant underpinning of knowledge. So that's basically what these competency programs are trying to do and what the standard is basically saying. So I had a question that came up actually just the other day about uh, intrinsic safety, you know, do I need to be competent in order to generate descriptive system documents? So what does the standard say? The Dash 25 standard says if the person who is responsible for creating that descriptive system document uh, has the necessary competence to fulfill this task. Now, in many cases, companies like GMI will actually create DSDs on the behalf of customers, right? That's a service that GMI will do but maybe you're in a situation where maybe GMI can't provide you that product. And unfortunately you have to find a different manufacturer and you don't know if that is going to work with this particular product. So what the standard is more or less saying is that the individual who's selecting these components should be competent and they should understand how to create your DSD and do your calculations for intrinsic safety. Now, in the manufacturing side of things, and this is a addition two that came out in 2018, again, competency is spelled out in the Dash 34 standard. And this, again, the organization shall take steps, measures to make sure that individuals are competent. Now, here's, here's the one thing I do want to highlight, and it's important to note because I don't want to mislead people. Notice what the standards don't say. The standards do not say that you must be certified under, say, for example, an IECEX scheme or a COMPEX scheme or some other outside scheme. The standards leave it open. It's ultimately up to the regulators to say, well, we recognize this, or it's up to the end user to say, well, we recognize this, or in some cases, maybe doing it in-house by your own technical people that can all meet those requirements. It really just depends. Uh, so I don't want to be here to tell you, you know, hey, you've got to contact me to come and get all your training and become competent. It, it's not, that's not what the standard is saying, but it is saying that these people who are in these various roles within organization shall have some sort of form of competency. And again, if it's done in-house or it's done external, uh, it shall be done. So there is a new technical specification that's being published, and I've heard that this may be pushed back. It was supposed to be coming out in May of next year, but this is a, a new technical specification called uh, 60079-44. 
and it will take the information that we had from 14 and 17 and expand upon it. Uh, more roles and responsibilities. Um, so it's going to take a lot of that information and build it and, and develop it as its own technical specification or standard, if you will. So uh, to tell you more about the IECEX competency scheme, uh, as, I, as Paolo mentioned, we do two different schemes. A lot of people are, are familiar with COMPEX and the IECEX has had a competency scheme now for I think around 12, 13 years or so. So what people typically understand under IECEX is the certification of products. You'll see certificates for products, GMI has them, all these manufacturers will have an IECEX certificate. But there's also um, a certified service facility scheme. Um, and that could involve people that are actually undertaking repairs to various EX equipment. And there's also a personnel competency scheme. So under the personnel competency scheme, it's broken down actually into 11 or 10 modules or 11 modules here. There's everything from 000 all the way up to 010. And different roles and responsibilities are meant uh, where, where a person wants to become competent, if you will. Typically, you would kind of pick and choose from these particular competency modules in order to best service uh, the people that are doing that particular work. So say, for example, if I'm an installer, I might take the 001 module, which is your fundamentals, and then take a 003, which is your installation. If I'm just doing inspections, I would take 001, and then I would probably do 007 and 008 for inspections. If I was a designer, I would take 001 and maybe 009, which is design information. 001 is actually the kind of the basic fundamentals one. And that gives you a general overview of, of the standards, the protection concepts, all of the, the nitty gritty, um, all the stuff, <laughs> if you will. And then the other modules kind of bolt onto those, if you will. So is training a requirement under the competency standards? If you noticed what it did say in there, it says the people shall be assessed to be deemed competent. It doesn't say, it does not say anything about being trained. Um, you could get your training from your own uh, efforts. You could, you could be out there, work experience and everything else. Training is not a requirement under these competency schemes. Now, most people will do the training because they want to, they want to learn. And then they also want to do better when they're being assessed. Right. So if you're making sure that, you know, we're not teaching the exams, but we're teaching a lot of the information that you may not be exposed to when we're doing these courses, but training is not a requirement. You can contact any of these IECEX certifying bodies and say, Hey, I just want to challenge against this module or this module. And if they offer those modules, they can do that. You do not have to come to what is called a recognized training provider. So I kind of mentioned this about the various modules uh, of which ones that I would recommend. You're seeing this somewhat showing up with customers uh, that they're starting to say, hey, look, if I've got technicians, I want them to have a 001 and a 003, so forth and so on. So how does the, the certifying body fit into this? Because these certificates are actually issued by an IECEX certifying body. So there are, I think at last count, about 15 IECEX certifying bodies that are able to offer the COPC scheme, if you will. So what they do is basically they administer uh, the exams, they administer the assessments, they do all that heavy lifting, and then they evaluate it and determine whether or not you pass or fail. Right. The there's also the role of what is called a recognized training provider. And we, my company, is actually an IEC X recognized training provider. And basically what that means is that we've been vetted by the IEC EX to be able to provide this training. Uh, again, it's not a requirement that you have to go through a recognized training provider. Again, you could go through it yourself. You could engage with anybody else that provides EX training and then ultimately contact the EXCBs. The benefit, however, of going to a, an RTP 
is that they typically have aligned themselves with an IECEX certifying body to basically kind of do everything in a one-stop shop type manner. So what we end up doing is that we work with a certifying body out of Canada called QPS Evaluation Services that in turn, we work with them, we provide the documentation, we invigilate the exams, we proxy the exams, we send them and we do all that good stuff and then they ultimately grade it, if you will. So a little bit more details on these modules. Um, in many cases, what you're seeing there on the right-hand side are actually uh, portable units. Um, we actually have the ability to take these around to various customers. So they don't necessarily have to be done at our facility. They can actually be done at a client's facility. So you can actually do a lot of the practical assessments, inspection modules, installation modules, do it at your facility. And there's discussion about doing it VR. There's discussion about doing it in all different other manners. Um, that's all kind of behind the scenes right now. And, you know, at some point in time, I think in the very near future, there's going to be a lot more announcements around that arena of what the IECEX is doing. I know Compex is doing some of that stuff online, uh, webinar based, and we can actually do a lot of the training webinar based as well. Um, how are the details on the exams? They're open book and open note. Um, so they are not easy, right? Because they are open note, open book, open standard. The questions are, are, are somewhat difficult. So just be aware of that. Uh, generally, they're a combination of multiple choice and uh, open-ended questions. Prerequisites. Uh, for the EX001, there is no prerequisite to come and take that and then to actually have your certificate issued. However, remember, competency is a, is a combination of the knowledge plus the experience. So what we want to make sure is, is that when individuals want to go through these programs, they should have at least three years of experience in EX before they really undertake this. So if you've had, you know, you come straight out of the university and you're doing some stuff, you know, give yourself a couple of years of doing this before you engage and start doing this. Um, because it is, it is a re requirement, if you will, that the EXCBs make sure that they confirm that, hey, you've actually been working in the EX business for a minimum of three years. So the training, again, can be done personal, it can be done via Zoom, Teams, uh, and it can also be done locally. So there's many different options. You can contact any of these recognized training providers. The IECEX does have a list of all of them on the website. And uh, check out and see what everybody else is doing. Um, so you can kind of find out more about that whole thing. Certificates are valid for five years. And then at the end of five years, it's expected uh, that you're, you're no longer competent, right? Because the standards do change. So, you know, you can, again, you don't have to go through the training. You can just say, okay, I've still been working in the EX business. I'm on top of things. I just want to be assessed. And that's an option. So, again, uh, as Estelito said and rightly said, the standard doesn't mandate it, right? It says shall. Uh, it says, or you should do this or shall be and all this good stuff. But ultimately, it's up to the regulators to make this determination. Or it's up to the end client to insist upon this and they write this in their specifications. Um, and again, training is not a requirement, but the assessment is. Here's the important thing to really remember. We spend all this money and time on very expensive EX equipment. Um, and if we don't design it right, or we don't select it correctly, or if we don't install it, or we don't maintain it, then why, bo why bother, right? Because we look at this EX as somewhat of a chain, right? The chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And everybody within this supply chain, all the way from the manufacturer, all the way down to uh, the guy that's maintaining it, the guy or, or girl that's maintaining this equipment, everybody has a part to play, even procurement, right? If they don't do the right thing when they're buying product, then that becomes an issue. Uh, supply houses, if they don't have knowledge, if they supply a, an alternative product, okay, that's fine. But making sure that, you know, if you're responsible for it, you should understand 
what the differences are. Uh, you should understand many manufacturers now have products in which they're making it one product or one size fits all. But you have to be aware of, okay, there may be limitations with some of these products if you want to take them into this market or use it in this technology. So there's a lot of different things that are important to understand with regards to EX. Um, again, getting away from the obvious things like maybe a gland is improperly installed or something like that. So we, again, don't want you to be that weakest link. Great, Bob. And we do have in have answers. I have and some live questions from Mr. Lito. And while you do that, you check those out. I will prepare the question and answer presentation. Okay. Uh, which I have to can we share? Okay. So yeah, the question uh, from Estelito, um, considering that many accidents point as root causes mechanical issues. Oops, uh, I just lost it for a second. I'll get back to it. Uh, mechanical issues, temperatures. Maybe people are induced to think that EX equipment are not so important for the safety, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I think that's a fair statement to say, Estelito. Um, a lot of root causes of major industrial accidents are actually mechanical in nature. Um, they could be things like bearings overheating. Uh, some of these major industrial dust accidents are, in many cases, mechanical equipment, conveyor systems, or static, or things like that. We don't necessarily think that it's necessarily an electrical issue. Um, it is actually a combination of both mechanical equipment and electrical equipment. And mechanical equipment, uh, there are now IEC standards that have been published uh, around the 80079, the dash 36 and dash 37 standards are addressing mechanical equipment and for use in hazardous locations. So Europe has been doing this for quite some time, the IEC in conjunction with the ISO has published these standards here recently. And as a matter of fact, a lot of people are not aware of, but here in the United States, we've actually published this as a UL standard as well. So mechanical uh, sources of ignition are big issues. We cover this within the training programs and, uh, and certainly they are, uh, I, I would say in many cases, a lot of people do think that mechanical are really the biggest problems. and in and in some cases, they really are. Um, another question regarding certification in Brazil, some equipment vendors got competent certificates of EX002 without any experience of doing area classification. Do you think that such situation compromises the confidence of an, an EX certification schemes? Absolutely, yes. Um, we, we run that module. Uh, that's the area classification module. And it is a very rigorous module to do. Uh, it's, it's, it's tough. It's one of the tougher modules to do area classification. Uh, you have to do a lot of calculations based upon sources of release, density, all of those types of things. Um, when we have candidates that want to come in and take that particular module, and, and we do this for everyone, um, we tell people, look, you must have three years of experience and you have to provide some sort of documentation, some sort of proof. So yes, if they can't provide that documentation, they can't provide that proof, then guess what? Our IEC EX certifying body is not going to issue a cert. Um, how we can address that, however, is that we can give them something that states, hey, they've been through the practical side of things or the examinations and maybe they've done very well. But until they come back with three years of experience, we're not able to issue a full IEC EX certificate. Okay, so, well, so let's go yeah. to some of these questions uh, yeah. that we got through the registration. Are you able to see it? I can see it, yes. Okay. So everybody should be able to see it. So I believe some of you may already have an answer to them, but who needs to have competency EX? Does a design engineer needs to have it? You can yeah. I haven't seen it yet. Here it is. Yeah, yeah. The short answer is yes. We've kind of talked about this a little bit. And again, kind of some of the questions that came up previously. The Dash 25 standard for designing of intrinsically safe electrical systems uh, does, does say that individuals that are doing design of intrinsically safe, doing your loop calculations or your DSDs, they should be done by a competent person. The area classification standard 10-1 does say 
specifically, you know, individuals who are responsible for area classification shall be deemed competent. So yes, design engineers um, in, a, in, a, in a roundabout way, yes, competency is coming. And again, it's, it's in the standards, it's been in the standards, it's up to the regulators to tell you this, but again, I'm seeing it from my own practical experience. I'm seeing it more from end users where they're putting it in their specifications. Uh, some of the major oil and gas companies are putting it in their specifications and they're requiring this. So you wanna read through, if you're a subcontractor, if you're a skid package manufacturer, <coughs> excuse me, or you know, supplying some equipment that you're doing something to, you know, pay particular close attention to these specifications and certainly check with the regulators, find out what the regulators are asking. And, and again, in, in some markets, it's, it's very regulated. In other markets, uh, it's next to none. Mm. Nice. Next question. How often do I need to evaluate the team competency? Yearly? How will I do that? Yeah, yeah. Generally, the formal competency programs are valid for five years. So both COMPEX and the IECEX certificates, when they get issued, they're valid for five years. Uh, some countries like Australia, that's written in their um, AS, I think it's 4870, I, I may be mistaken on the standard. Uh, they actually have a requirement that the certificates competency need to be validated every four years, right? And again, the standard doesn't require an outside entity provide competency assessment. Uh, but again, most companies and some regulators do require an outside entity to determine whether or not that person is deemed competent for the particular role. So I, again, I don't want to mislead people and just tell you, hey, you all have to run out and get your competency done. And that's, you know, hey, that's, it's good for me, right? But on the other hand, I don't want to, I don't want to sell you something in which you don't uh, you don't require. It's a good idea uh, whether or not it's mandated in your particular country or in your particular role is again left up to what you're doing. And again, this is another thing. Some schemes may have limitations. So there are certificates that will be issued and the certificate will be issued says that this individual uh, may have passed this module, this module, this module, and so forth and so on. But just like special conditions for safe use with a product, you will see conditions on certain circums, uh, on cert certificates issued for people that they may be limited. Maybe they can only do installation of EXD and EXE. Maybe they weren't able to be validated and assessed against other protection concepts. So just be aware of that. Um, uh, and, that's, and we have to do that ahead of time to make sure are we, are we, as a trainer, are we making sure that we're training them to be able to do all this? And then QPS has to make sure, is there any limitations with this individual? If not, then we're gonna evaluate them against all of the requirements. The next question, Bob, I believe you already answered, you know, several people are posting a certificate, but do not have experience. Uh, this will uh, damage the reputation of the certification you said, you know, basically you told us three years are mandatory requirement. If you do not have that experience, you cannot get a cert. Now, if you, some people are out there without maybe. Yeah, if, if a person, it's, it's tough to tell, obviously, if, if somebody is putting a certificate on their social media, and I see it as well, you know, whether or not that individual has that experience. Now, again, with the exception of 001, every other module does require at least three years of experience. So. If anybody is doing that, um, I, I would just say this, if, if you saw a certificate and it was listed on there, you know, the way you can validate, by the way, these certificates is actually go to the IECEX website and you can look up their certificate. Now, what it will not tell you is how much experience that that individual has. Uh, it'll have what is called a P car that you can actually download. And that's the evaluation uh, personal competency assessment report that was issued by the IECEXCB that basically, hey, we looked at their experience and it all checked out, right? Uh, but that doesn't excuse somebody from skirting the rules, right? Uh, and, if, and if there is a certifying body that is skirting the rules and not doing that, uh, hopefully they get caught. 
you know, by the IECEX auditors. And I, and I will tell you, a lot of the IECEX certifying bodies, uh, they're going to be looking at their competitors to find out to make sure, hey, if, if they're not doing something right, uh, they're going to bring it up. And uh, so they're, you know, they want to keep it a level playing field. Yeah, I imagine, it, you know, there's very little cheating. Uh, you know, when you present uh, your, uh, your certificate, you know, your, you sign in, you got to provide all that information. Your boss has right. to sign it off. You know, it's, it's possible that somebody can cheat. But, you know. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. We struggle. In we every have... field, you know, in every, <laughs> we find, we, we, uh, we have seen doctors, you know, operating on patients for 10 years without a degree. You know, they, once right. they get caught, they say, wow, how is that possible? But, yeah, we, we spend a lot of time. Uh, we have a class going on this week, a complex class, and uh, a lot of guys are in or people are in and you know that's one of the things some of the some of the folks didn't bring all their uh background experience and and all that other good stuff so we're having to scramble to try to get some documentation from uh their employer to basically say hey has this person done this 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 and have been you with you for this amount of time so forth and so on so well next as a manufacturer of a certified iex equipment do we need ICX training certification in order to perform sales support and service of the product that we sell? I guess. Here yeah. We go. Yeah. They manufacturers do have competency requirements, and and why this was really brought in. So there was the first edition of this standard was published. I think it was in two thousand and nine, and it's basically a bolt on to your ISO nine thousand and one. The second edition that came out basically added all of this competency requirements uh, in the 2018 version. And the reason why that was done was when manufacturers go in and audit the manuf uh, when the certifying bodies go in to audit the manufacturers that are building EX equipment, they were finding all kinds of issues that were done internally, right? And, and generally speaking, up until that point, it was really, okay, well, that's the role of the certifying body. You know, they should be catching these before the product leaves the shop floor. However, in the real world, they're only audited, you know, periodically. So a lot of product was getting out into the field that was either mismarked or that was wrong or something. And, and it shouldn't be up to the end customer to catch this. So this standard was basically expanded to include all these competency requirements. So it's really up to whoever the auditor is to maintain their certification, to maintain their ISO certification, to make that determination of whether those individuals are deemed competent. Uh, certainly an IECEX COPC or a COMPEX certificate or something like that could do that, but it doesn't say that it has to be that. All right, the next question, I think I tap it wrong because uh, he says it's a company, but it's actually, is competency mandated by the legislation? We answer very clearly not, but what about the liability to fail to demonstrate competency? Can this be brought back to the individual doing the work or his boss or? Yeah, so, well, it's, it's somewhat similar um, again, some countries do require demonstration of competency. Um, there is certain markets in which you cannot step foot in a facility to do any electrical work without providing this documentation. Um, it's, you know, where does the liability fall if, say, for example, a company, if it's, if it's regulated and a company doesn't do it, who's responsible? Well, generally speaking, it's going to be upper management who's going to be responsible if, if something happens. Uh, this, is, this is very similar in concept to compliance under the ATEX directive for Zone 2. For Zone 2 equipment, Category 3, equipment does not necessarily have to be certified by a notified body. But the manufacturer still has the obligation to do those tests, whatever those requirements are, and keep that information in a technical file then what they do, they issue a manufacturer's EU declaration of conformity. When they issue that declaration of conformity, it is signed by the technical manager of that company. So if that product goes into service, I have my piece of paper, EU declaration of conformity, and that product fails, 
guess what? That individual can be held liable personally, and it could be both criminal and civil, depending on which country it's located. So the penalties for, you know, under the ATEX directive can be pretty, pretty onerous. Um, that's a little bit different scenario than, than what we're talking about here. But yeah, you could argue, in effect, that you know, if if you're or if the regulators are requiring this and you skirt the regulators, well, then it's up to the regulators to make that determination. You know, are are they going to get uh, fined? Are they going to get jailed? Or what what's going to happen? Typically, you know, here in Europe, we have uh, the legal liability always falls back to the top management, actually the managing director. Yes, to demonstrate yeah. that he did all in his power to avoid what happened down. And then as it, that goes down, then eventually the individual is responsible. But he has to prove that he has made sure that, the, for example, if a competence was required, that he went for the training or whatever else. And if yeah. he that, then he is responsible. Yeah, it, it's so no... Even it's, the US law, so I'm not sure there. <laughs> Well, no, I mean, even if you think about the, the Boeing issue with the 737 MAX planes, right, that went down, um, I mean, ultimately the chairman, I mean, he got let go, okay, now he, he made $62 million in his golden parachute, so he's not spending any time in prison, but yeah, um, you know, ultimately the responsibility falls on the executives, whoever are responsible for any issues that your product can, can, can cause. All right, let's see, we have uh, always, we get these questions, always in, you know, the question and answer. How do I find out more or what else can I do? Here it is, how you find out more. Yeah, so so on the IECEX website, there's a lot of free information. The document you'd probably want to get, and it's free, it's OD504. And this will provide you a lot of specific information on each module, uh, what's covered against, how you're assessed, and then there's also a lot of brochures and videos on the on uh, on the IECEX website. And then, of course, you know, drop either Paulo or myself a note, and we'll be happy to try to answer any questions that you might have. All right. Let me see next. Well, as I said, always we also get this. We are interested in a webinar on you know different webinars, so you can look those up in our uh, schedule, online schedule for the next webinars. We also record all our webinars. So you can see them uh, online on the YouTube channel. Please uh, remember to, you know, how do we say it? Register or uh, say you like it. Or I'm not sure. You know, give us a thumbs. We need new people registered in our YouTube channel. Otherwise, Anna is not happy. Uh, <laughs> so let me go to, uh, we have a last poll, but to do the last poll, I need to do this. Do this. And, you know, please, guys. Uh, tell us how we did, but tell us uh, not how Paolo did, but how Bob did, okay? <laughs> if it was excellent, it was me. If it was poor, it's Paolo. <laughs> yeah, no, Paolo's always poor. Okay, yeah. well, you guys answer that. I will try to uh, close this. This is our page, our uh, tuck -tuck. So you have our numbers. And thank you. Let me try to stop okay sharing stop the poll show you the result so okay good is for paolo excellence for bob thank uh -huh. you so guys today we did very good bob we are right on time one hour there we go we did how about that this is the first time i think we are right on time <laughs>